Hi, welcome back to another episode of Ask Lattice. As you can see, we're back in the office now. Uh, we're sticking with general guidelines and um, we are trying to stick with the two meter apart rule. So as you can see, Finn is guiding that and making sure that we don't go too close to each other. So first things first, we're talking about this lockdown. Tom, what's happened with your haircut? My hair? Yeah. yeah. Well, I've just generally been at a distance. I've been confused. I'm, I'm just all over the place, Ollie. And that gives you another insight into the mind of Tom Randall. <laughs> so what we're gonna go through today is how do you get back to the crag? So we've all been training hard indoors or hopefully been training hard indoors. Uh, we've had limited equipment available to us. Hopefully you've had a fingerboard or a home board or something available to do some form of training on. But either way, what's going to happen now that we're able to go outside, whether you are in the UK and hopefully it will be allowed out soon, or in other countries where you're starting to go out climbing already. Okay, so the questions that we're going to go through today are going to be very much on this topic of returning to normal climbing again from our kind of lockdown scenarios. And we've seen quite a broad range of questions come through. So Ollie and I are going to try and take some of the most popular topics, really common things that a lot of you are asking either on social media or within the clients and athletes that we work with at the moment and give you your best kind of um, trajectory back to performance again, whether it's indoors or outside on real rock. Question one is, um, and this is a good one actually, Ollie, um, is it okay to feel rubbish when you go back to normal climbing, whether it's indoors or outdoors? Is it normal? Is everyone else in the same boat? So I would say this is just like coming back from a season of training anyway, and you should treat it in the same way. It's just a little bit more acute in the sense you've, you've probably done less climbing than normal because you've not been inside either. So I guess the, the quick answer is yes, it's fine to feel terrible i'm really expecting to feel absolutely awful but the key thing is that is it's a short period and it's just going into it acknowledging that you will feel a little bit rusty rock climbing is a highly skilled sport and it requires a lot of movement efficiency and confidence whether you're on a rope bouldering or doing traditional climbing so all of those skill sets are something that are constantly being developed and if you're not doing them for a month, two months, three months, depending on when your lockdown began, in what country you're in, um, you're gonna feel a little bit rusty at those skills. Yeah, it's this thing for me, and even though we haven't had this kind of scenario before, I have been in periods where I might not have climbed for two weeks, four weeks, sometimes a little bit longer actually. And I think the most important thing with this is to manage your expectations and be a little bit kind to yourself to go, look, I haven't had access to uh, indoor climbing or outdoor climbing. And so we can adjust that expectation of how well you'll do when you go back outside so that you're still motivated, engaged with the process of getting back into, sh well, not getting back into shape, but getting the feeling back for real rock. And you aren't harsh and you don't have bad takeaways from those experiences because the amount of times that I've done this over the past, especially when I take kind of long winter transition periods where I might take uh, quite a bit of time off from uh, real rock, is that probably one to two weeks of climbing, I feel like four, five, six grades off where I should be, even though I might be in quite good shape physically or I don't feel that bad in terms of how I should perform outside, but I set my expectations low so that if I go back outside and rather than climbing on an 8A, for example, I'm climbing on a 7A, that's absolutely fine. It's part of the process and I really take the enjoyment out of that because for most of us, training and climbing and performance is a journey and we've got to be really into the process and enjoying it. And so if you manage your expectations realistically and well, you're going to be in that process in a much more enjoyable manner. So I think this is one of the most important things to do and that's giving yourself time when you go back outside. So I think the best way of trying to do this and giving yourself that little bit of leniency is if you have a specific project you've been thinking about, yes, it's fine to get on that straight away, but try and build up slowly, doing some other mileage at the same time. And like Tom said, 
go into that project climb, just being really, really lenient on yourself. Realistically, I would try and put it back a few weeks, but I know that some of you are struggling with seasons and it's coming to the end of the seasons and you wanna see if you can get your projects finished. But try and get some other mileage done, at least in the first few sessions whilst you're going out. Reduce the intensity a little bit and just build up slowly. I'd also say try and vary the angles and vary the styles of climbing quite a bit as well. So try and do a bit of bouldering, try and do a bit of root climbing if you're a root climber, uh, but mix it up and just make sure that you're focusing on that enjoyment aspect to begin with. Big thing as well is spend a lot longer warming up. So try and do loads more movements during the warm up because that's when you're going to feel most rusty. This one leads well into the next question, uh, which is actually quite a common scenario with a lot of our more well-conditioned climbers. So those really strong, well-conditioned athletes who are able to generate a lot of force in the upper body. And what a lot of people in that scenario are finding at the moment is that they are pulling and generating a lot of force, particularly because they've done a lot of bar work, uh, fingerboard work, you know, pull-ups, 45 degree board work, and they're not able to use their feet and they're struggling to create that kind of synergy or that connection between the lower body and the upper body and it's really out of sync. So in a way they've become like front wheel drive climbers and they're just pulling like mad with their hands in their upper body but they're not able to help that climbing with the lower body as well. And we know how important that is in climbing even on steep terrain. So this question is all about how do we bring that connection back with the lower body and the upper body and driving efficiency from our feet as well. I guess the easiest way to answer this one is when you're trying to develop the upper body, you spend a lot more time on steeper climbs and you spend a lot more time on those style of climbing which forces you to use your upper body and fingers a lot more. So let's just flip this around. If we're trying to engage our lower body, make sure our footwork is better and the ability to provide force through the feet is let's knock off the angle, spend more time on slabs and vert and on climbs which force you to perform in that way. So anything where the holds become a bit smaller for your hands and you have to really rely on your feet is gonna be a great way to start pushing your performance from the lower body. And it's like just like going on a board for your fingers, climbing on the slab, is going to force you to put much more weight through those feet and learn the skill set again. Yeah, I think this is a, definitely a really good approach to take with this. And um, as well as kind of trying to put that climbing uh, in a sort of intentional way into the climbing when you go outside, it's about taking a volume approach with it as well. And I've always found this every year when I go back to, you know, getting my in touch with the ro outdoor rock again and really getting that feel and flow of climbing back again is it responds really well to a high volume approach. So it's not necessarily about doing really hard climbing on that vertical terrain, slabby climbing, although that does play a part, so don't ignore it, but it's really, really valuable still to get loads of volume. So lots of time, lots of moves done on rock in, the, in that vertical, technical, slabby terrain. So an example of doing this for me would be that I, when I first go back outside again, I might, go back on some harder routes, start to break down the sections or some harder bouldering. But then at the end of the day, when I start to lose that kind of edge, that top end, I may well then spend an hour of time just covering very, very easy mileage on rock. And it can just be play, it can be fun, it can be challenges, it can be doing stuff, you know, barely with any hands at all. But it's at that time that really rewards on that aspect. And if you put that in, in those first couple of weeks, you'll find your ramp back into moving well be a lot faster. And this, this sort of mileage aspect goes across all different uh, rock types as well. So even if you're focused on quite steep limestone sport climbing or bouldering, just doing that mileage on stuff that involves the feet a lot more is still gonna be uh, really beneficial for you at this moment in time. One thing to keep in mind though is something I'd probably recommend is try and avoid doing too much traversing at the bottom of the crag and classing that as the mileage. Um, even though it's still really useful and it's better than nothing, you're going to spend a lot of time probably doing less foot movements or sideways movements to do fitness or climbing on boards or circuit boards. So um, try and get a lot more upwards movement if possible. So you're getting used to stepping up onto your feet, rocking over it and shifting your weight from side to side to really apply weight to the feet rather than just shuffling sideways. Okay, that leads us nicely again, actually, into the next question, which is around the 
balance that we see from hanging versus moving. And Ollie and I have seen this in emails and we've had it in calls that we've made with climbers that we're working with where they are struggling to move from that ability to, and this is particularly pertinent for people who have just been doing hangboarding and haven't had any kind of 45 degree system boards or, or bouldering that they can do at home, is they want to move from that uh, ability to hang and create a lot of force in a static, you know, non-movement based position to actually generating force on rock. So they feel super strong on their fingers but they're not generating any momentum or any force or explosivity when they go back into rock. So what would you say are our you know, key things that we're doing on that front in terms of bringing some explosivity, some momentum carry back onto rock? Well, I think the first thing you can do, which is whilst you're still at home, is start flipping a lot of your training towards that fast contractile speed. So if you're doing pull-ups, start doing them a lot faster, reduce the load. If you're doing any sort of fingerboarding, use bigger holds and start doing movements on them, so pull-ups on those holds. Um, if you're doing any board climbing, try and make it focused on doing larger movements as well, rather than just snatching between holds if you've got a short board. Because that tends to be what happens when we're doing more board climbing. Um, taking this outside, once again, it's trying to focus on doing the real movements, so going upwards as much as you can, and try and really focus on generating a lot of force throughout the entire body. So bringing those first two facts into account is learning to use your feet and like bringing a lot of weight onto that foot, explaining off that, but then also providing powerful movements. So even if it's a bit easier and doing a lot more mileage and getting used to that style of climbing, just start getting into a flow of movement makes a massive difference to transferring that hanging static uh, strength into actually usable function. Yeah, that's a good point actually. Um, and I think that, transfer when we go back outside is going to become extra valuable if you're able to put a little bit more focus on the bouldering element of climbing for the moment whether you're a boulder specialist or a root climber and i'm really encouraging a lot of the root climbers in particular who typically don't do as much bouldering outside because they specialize in that you know roped climbing and that's their thing and a lot of their time um, outdoors is spent focusing on that is that as part of their warm-up or even the sort of the higher end high quality performance part of the day when they're outside is just getting a bit more bouldering done in those first couple of weeks back outside because that really enables you to connect with uh, the momentum that you're generating throughout climbing movement it's harder higher intensity higher quality work typically and that gives you that kind of boost to be able to transfer that hanging static uh, high force generation that you're getting from the dead hang work to actually moving well on rock because let's face it if you're bouldering well outside and you've got the fitness to be able to apply it on a route you're going to climb even better and do harder grades quicker so it's, it's totally relevant um, and likewise I think for the boulderers it's putting more of that explosive work into the beginning of that high quality portion of your session when you're going outside. Last question that we're going to go through today is uh, one about how we manage our outdoor climbing in with any maintained training focus during this period. So we've typically for a lot of us have gone from being almost 100% of training um, in the last four to six weeks or so. And now we might be going for a 50-50 split or perhaps we might even go in completely outside. And it's really around how do we manage that balance of transitioning from lots and lots of focus of training, indoor climbing or home climbing or home training to now going outside. How do we balance that? So I'd probably start by saying, I think it's good to be conservative here. So if you imagine that you are going to be going out one day a week and currently you've been training four days a week, um, you could say that is you need to drop 25% of your training load to accommodate that time outside. I would actually go, it needs to be a lot further than that because realistically, you're probably going to be really psyched and you're going to be really happy to go and move outside and do lots more than you perhaps would normally. And you might not be quite as controlled. I can't imagine I will be when we start going outside either. So that's totally fine, but probably just be a little bit more conservative than you might think or the numbers might just seem at first when you start going outside as well. So drop, drop it off a little bit more. 
Secondly is probably think about what you want to do long term still, so don't completely negate that. If you are going to go outside and you still want to work towards a trip or a goal later in the year, then you need to work out what you need to try and maintain in the training sessions that you are doing. So if your focus is on fitness for later in the year, when hopefully we can still go outside or go on trips perhaps, is to try and make sure that at some point in your week, you're going to be doing this fitness training as well. So if you go outside bouldering, because it's probably one of the easy options right now, then it's good to make sure that you drop any of the intense stuff inside and you focus more on the fitness when you're at home training. And vice versa, if you're trying to get stronger and you go outside and you do roots, then perhaps just make sure that you maintain the strength element of your home training. One word of warning that I would like to make on this particular subject area, and it's something that I've seen a lot as a coach over the years, whether it's someone that I'm, or a group of people I'm working with, or the climbing community in general, is that people tend to get quite attached to their training process over the winter season and their training season. And then when they come outside, they don't really want to let go of that and go into the performance phase. And this is a classic time for people to pick up little just weird niggles because they're trying to still train and do a lot of that, but then also trying to perform on top. So they're spending a much, much higher degree of their time, essentially trying to train and perform and then climb and perform. And it's all too much for the body. So what they need to do is just let go of that training process a little bit, give them some space and allow to transfer that quality of work, that high intensity work into the climbing outside. And I think this tends to be because people are often moving to smaller holds as they go outside. So they're going projects, they're doing things that are really maximal for them. And secondly, is that compared to indoor holds, is holds outside are just weird shapes and they're not totally uniform. They haven't de designed by a hold shaper. They're not these beautiful kind of rounded edges which perfectly load the fingers. They're weird. They're sharp, they're in cut, they're offset. And I think this really contributes to just picking up a little bit more nigg niggles. And the answer to this would be is to just drop that load from your training when you're making that transition and be much more conservative than you really think you could be. So that concludes another episode. We're going to start doing these more regularly again, but please keep an eye out for them on our YouTube channel. We also have some big things happening regarding webinars and Facebook groups. So keep in touch with our social media because we'll be releasing loads more educational resources really soon. So for me and Tom, uh, we'll see you soon. Make sure to like and subscribe.